Yes. Uh, we we uh, went right past the sin, the sin unto death. Is, is that because we're going to come back to that later, or? Uh, that's because it's uh, it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah, I mean, this a sin a sin unto death is just in the end. It just always seems to come back to it's a sin from which you cannot repent or have not repented or you're so locked into the sin that you will not repent. Um, it's a vehement opposition to the Holy Spirit, to the gospel, the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit by rejecting Christ and the gospel. Um, that ultimately is the sin unto death. Seems to me. Okay. Um, all right. Describe the origins of the Sabbath day. What is the biblical warrant for changing it from the first, from the seventh day to the first day of the week? All right. As it is the law of nature that in general a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God. Agree with that? The law of nature. If there is a God, he should be worshipped. So some time should be set aside to worship him. Okay. Um, so in his word, by a positive, moral, and perpetual commandment, binding all men in all ages, he hath particularly appointed one day in seven. So a positive command is one that's not um, bit rooted in nature. It's just a divine declaration. Um, a moral command is built into the fabric of things. Uh, perpetual, you know, means that it's... Last forever and ever. Yes, it is forever. Uh, commandment, binding all men in all ages, he hath appointed, uh, particular, particularly appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy unto him which from the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ was the last day of the week, and from the resurrection of Christ was changed unto the first day of the week, which in Scripture is called the Lord's Day, and is to be continued to the end of the world as the Christian Sabbath. So question 7 is, or what am I saying? Question 17 what is the origin of the Sabbath day? It's built into nature, in a sense, because a due proportion of time. Um, but as for the particulars of uh, exactly when, that is by uh, command, of scriptural revelation. Uh, so God very clearly commanded the, you know, the people of, well, go, going back to Genesis 2, so biblical warrant, Genesis 2, establishes a Sabbath principle, that God rested on the seventh day. The implication of that is that uh, we are to be imitators of God, and so we are to rest on the seventh day. So you had the seventh day Sabbath from the creation of the world until the resurrection of Christ. Uh, the specifics then are spelled out in, in the Ten Commandments and in the other legislation. Some of that is ceremonial. The core, the heart of it is moral. It's in the Ten Commandments. Um, and as such, it is a part of the moral law. Because a due proportion of service is due to God, and then he specifies what's that, what that is to be. So one, one in seven. Six days are yours to pursue your vocation, as it were, not uh, in ignorance of God or um, the neglect of God, but the, there is a day set aside where all our recreations and employment, uh, employment cease, and that day is given wholly uh, to the service of God. Uh, why was the day changed? The resurrection of Christ. Yes. Of the resurrection and his appearances and disappearances reinforce that. So he appears, he, he is resurrected on uh, the first day of the week. He then appears to the disciples. Uh, then one week later, he appears to them again in the upper room. Uh, then after he is ascended, then Pentecost is a, sun, is a Sunday as well. So the, the, the spirit is given on Sunday. So you have you, uh, on, on the first day of the week. Uh, 
so, and then as you go through the New Testament, you find in 1 Corinthians 16 that the collection is being taken up on the first day of the week. You have the Apostle Paul in Acts, what is it, 21, where he remains in Troas, uh, waiting for the church to assemble on the first day of the week so he can meet with them. So it's, uh, it's, it's fairly clear that in the uh, already in apostolic times, uh, the day for uh, rest and worship has moved from the last day of the week uh, to the first day of the week so that history has a kind of sabbatical structure to it. So if you put the cross in the middle, uh, you know, they, they, they work and then rest. They look forward to their rest, Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we rest and, and then we go to work. So we begin with rest with the first day of the week. And they look forward to that rest. We look back to that rest. As we go to work, we look back to the rest. We begin with our rest. We begin with the first day of the week. We rest and then work. They worked and then rested. So there is kind of a sabbatical structure to history in that, in that, in that respect. So anyway, that, that's the argument of, of the confession, that the day is changed by the resurrection of Christ. Um, and most of the authors would continue to argue that uh, based also as well uh, on, the, on, on, you know, on Pentecost. And, and then, and then in Revelation 1.10, uh, you know, John is in the spirit on the Lord's day. There's a day being claimed again, just like with the Sabbath is the Lord's day. So... Uh, we have the Lord's Day being identified in Revelation 1.10. Oh, okay, uh, 18, how is the Christian Sabbath to be observed? The Sabbath is to be kept holy unto the Lord when men, after a due preparing of their hearts, all right, you need to get ready for the day. Uh, so what do you do? You, you know, when people had checkbooks, you know, you balance your checkbook. Uh, you, you, you give attention to the final chores that need to be done around the house. You prepare for Monday work. You get all that lined up and set aside. Uh, so you, 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 you order by, uh, by the ordering of their common affairs beforehand. So, so you're preparing the heart. Uh, you're getting your heart ready. Uh, part of that is ordering of your common affairs, getting everything lined up and ready to go so that there isn't any leftover work that's going to tyrannize you during the day and tempt you to you know, to pick up your, pick up your work and, and, and get some of that done. Uh, do not only observe a holy rest all the day from all their work, words, and thoughts about their worldly employments and recreations. And, are all, and also are taken up the whole time in the public and private exercises of his worship and in the duties of necessity and, and mercy. So it's not uh, the Lord's hour, it's not the Lord's morning, it's, uh, it's not the Lord's morning and then the Lord's evening, it's the Lord's day. There, it is the Christian Sabbath. If you want my ideas on this subject, there is a little booklet entitled The Christian Sabbath that you may purchase at the bookstore for only $4.99. All right. Um, no, I don't know what it costs. Now, then it mentions the duties of necessity and mercy. So there are exceptions. Uh, so what are those exceptions? Well, necessary works. Um, for example, works of piety. The organist works. The preacher works. The deacons work. The elders work. Uh, for us to provide meals, there are cooks that work. There are people that clean up. The care groups clean up. So there are works of piety, there are works of necessity, this is the ox in the ditch kind of thing, necessity, um, and mercy. Necessity is a little more difficult to define, but mercy, doctors work, nurses work, um, pharmacies remain open. I think in the modern times, uh, I think you know, somebody needs to get the, keep the power company going, or there would be you know, untold human suffering, unnecessary human suffering. So Jesus says, recorded in all three Gospels, that the Sabbath was made for man. I, I think that's always to be kept in view. It is for us. It is for our good. And one of the questions I'm asking here is, um, 
you know, in addition to 18, how is the Christian Sabbath to be observed? Well, it's to be served, to be served a 24 hour rest from worldly employments and recreations and to, is devoted to rest and to the things of God. So you go to church Sunday morning and Sunday night. You are to uh, take the time to read scripture, to pray, to read godly literature, the time that you don't have ordinarily during the week for uh, you know, reading a Christian biography or you know, giving, giving a, reading a, a rich a Christian classic. You would, you, would, you would use Sunday for that purpose. Um, it's, it's my, my, you know, the, the recent study that just showed that only 12% of the PCA churches have an evening service. I think with the breakdown of the Sabbath, you have the breakdown of the Sunday night service. I think the two are in, inseparably entwined. Because uh, if you do not have a Sunday night service and you get home at 12 noon or 1 o'clock, you've got the whole day for what? It's going to be very few people who are going to be able to resist mowing the lawn, raking the leaves, dusting, <clears throat> going out to the you know to buy some things, flipping on the television. Uh, they're, 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 you, you've got too much time to waste, um, and there are very few people so thoroughly spiritually minded they are going to spend the whole rest of the day. So if you don't have a strong Christian Sabbath, uh, doc. If you don't have a Sunday night service, it's going to be hard to maintain a, 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 a doctrine of the Sabbath. If you don't have a doctrine of the Sabbath, it's going to be hard to maintain a Sunday night service. <laughs> so why would I come back? I mean, I've got all this other stuff to do. I already came in the morning. Why would I come back at night? If you have a strong Christian Sabbath doctrine, then there, there's, there's the understanding the whole day. So of course I'm going to come back for Sunday night because the whole day is the Lord's day. It's not the Lord's morning. It's the Lord's day. So I'm going to come back for Sunday night. I'm going to stay for the meal and enjoy the fellowship of the saints. Um, I'm, um, you know, so that there is, I think, a very helpful rhythm to the day that we enjoy as a church. So, you know, you come, you come for Sunday school, you come for the morning service, you, 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 hang, you, hang, you linger a little bit and talk to people, you go home, you have your lunch, you take a nap, you pick up uh, your Bible, and you read it for a little while. That, you know, there's not a lot of time, but you, you can read that biography you wanted to read. Um, you know, I'm reading one right now, looking forward to having Sunday afternoon to read it some more. And, and then you come back for Sunday night, you have the meal, the day's over. The time you get home, it's 8 o'clock at night, and the day's over. Uh, so you sit down, you relax for a few minutes, you go to bed. So it's easy to keep a Sabbath day uh, uh, when you have a Sunday night service, and it's easy to be devoted to the Sunday night service when you believe in the Sabbath day. Uh, so uh, how is it to be observed? You know, it's a whole day given to the things of God. What is implied about the Christian life by the command to set aside an entire day for the things of God? I think what's implied is that we need a whole day. Uh, so the, the, in other words, the, uh, the issue that I would raise is, why is, why is, it, why is our daily devotions not enough? Uh, or, or even why is our daily devotions plus a Sunday morning and a Sunday night service not enough? Why a whole day? I think the implications of whole day is that we need a whole day. That in order to counteract the effects of being in the world as the people of God surrounded by the ungodly influences uh, that uh, we encounter you know, all day long, every day, that we need a whole day. That our souls will only flourish if we have a strong uh, doctrine of the Sabbath where we devote the whole day to the things of God. We need it. That's the implication of a day. Uh, that this daily thing that we do, reading and praying, that's not enough. It will not sustain us. We will not spiritually flourish. We need a whole day uh, given over to the things of God if we are really going to thrive first. Now, we can get along otherwise, but we, we won't flourish like we would have if, if we had devoted ourselves uh, wholly to the things of God. Um, did I read all the uh, sections? Yes, all right. Now we're on to lawful oaths and vows. All right, when may an oath be used? Any, any questions on the Sabbath before I move on? Yeah, it's just out of curiosity, why do you think that the 88% have gone the way that they've gone? I, I think it's hand in glove with the breakdown of the Sabbath. The most frequently cited reason for uh, recording a, um, a, um, what do they call it, an objection, not an objection, there's another word for it, um, exception. exception. 
to the uh, confession, which ministers when they're ordained and elders when they're ordained are required to declare, do you have any exceptions? And the most commonly cited one is the fourth commandment. So I think that you have, even among ministers, you have a breakdown of belief in the sanctity of the Lord's day. Uh, a breakdown, and, he, and, and you've seen, probably seen me do this before, but it, it just seems to me just blatantly arbitrary that you've got, you've got these, you've got these Ten Commandments. And, you know, can, can you have other gods? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, can you have graven images? No, you can't do that. Um, take the Lord's name in vain? No, you can't do that. Dishonor your parents? No, can't do that. Um, can you murder? No, no. Commit adultery? No. Um, can you um, steal? No. Uh, bear false witness? No. Is it okay to covet? No, can't do that. Oh, but to go right here in the middle of the 10 and just X that out, as though the other nine apply, and then there, here's this one exception. Does that not just strike you as just a little bit arbitrary and self-serving? Because I don't want to have to do that. I'm going to just decide this doesn't apply anymore. I think it's, um, I think it's obviously and blatantly self-serving, and it is out of accord with the practice of generation after generation and generation of Reformed Christians. You know, uh, for, for that matter, uh, medieval Catholicism. No, nobody has understood the Lord's Day to be anything but the Lord's Day. Now, there's been varying degrees of strictness. Uh, medieval Catholic casuistry had all sorts of distinctions about what's allowed and what's not allowed, but it's a lot stricter than the typical evangelical Christian today, even the Roman Catholics. So the Lutherans were not as tight, the Anglicans were not as tight, the Reformed Church has been very tight about what we, what we understand to be required and what we understand the exceptions to be. So uh, there, from, um, what are, uh, we are not allowed unlawful recreations and employments, but there are lawful recreations and employments. So the employments like the works of necessity, piety, and mercy. Those are lawful employments. Are there lawful recreations? Um, you know, the Dutch would always would, used to talk about um, Sabbath restraint. Yeah, I mean, uh, some fresh air, moderate exercise, competitive athletes. No, that's not really. That's not really. You know, you can't go down to the YMCA and get in, get all heated up in a bas competitive basketball game and really honor the Lord's Day. Your your head's going to be somewhere else. Don't don't you know? Just be honest with yourself. You can't do it. So you've got to have a different view of the Sabbath, or you have to recognize that. You know, a moderate amount of exercise, take a walk on the beach, as long as there's no, no female sunbathing. Uh, <laughs> you know, a walk in the forest would be better. Uh, you, know, you know, moderate exercise, throw the ball back and forth some. Do you remember chariots of fire? Mm -hmm. And the kid, uh, two kids come running by and a football goes bouncing, a soccer ball goes bouncing by. And, uh, you know, um, uh, what's his name? Eric. Eric Little says, you know, to the little little guy, oh, Sunday's not a day for football now, is it? Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, you know, that was the Scottish Sabbath. You know, when the trains first ran in Scotland, the, the, the Glasgow to Edinburgh train, when the train arrived in Edinburgh, there was a great crowd of angry Scottish Presbyterian ministers there to greet it and denounce the people who rode on it. Mm. So, you know, this is a part of our heritage. Mm. We have a tight view of the Sabbath because we think it's necessary for the, well, we think it's commanded, but it's necessary for the health and well-being of the soul. Yes. If we violate a commandment, we're sinning, correct? Yes. Okay. So if we violate the Sabbath, we're supposed to repent. Do you think there's a whole lot of preachers or people at all these churches that are repent, repenting for not? They don't anything? think they're breaking a commandment. That's, that's my whole point. They, they have crossed out before. Even though it's written on the tablets that God used his finger to write upon. Uh, you know, I think I should make that very point. Oh, yeah, I did make that point when preaching through the Ten Commandments. <laughs> yeah, these are the only, this is the only part of the Bible that's actually written by the finger of God on stone. It's, you, know, to, you know, underscoring the permanence of these. Yeah, no, nothing else was written on stone. Nothing else was written by his own finger. 
but, but uh, we're back to unhitching from the Old Testament. Excuse me? <laughs> we're back to unhitching from the Old Testament. Yeah, is the, is the Old Testament normative for us? And in what, in, what, in, in what ways is it normative for us? All right, so lawful oaths. A lawful oath is a part of religious worship wherein upon just occasion. In other words, you don't have an oath just for anything. Uh, a person swearing solemnly calleth God to witness what he asserteth or promise. So there are promissory oaths and assertive oaths. Promissory would be, uh, so help me God, I will deliver the milk tomorrow. Uh, an assertive oath is, what I say, God as my witness, what I say is true. So one's a promise, one's an assertion. Two kinds of oaths. And to judge him according to the truth or falsehood of what he sweareth. So when you put your hand on the Bible in court and say, I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, you are calling upon, our confession says, God to judge me according to the truth or falsehood of what I'm swearing. I'm, I'm, I'm inviting God to judge my, my, my um, uh, truthfulness of what I'm saying in the courtroom. That's the whole subject behind vows in court. You lawyers want to disagree with that? So we're getting away from that. I know they're taking some, some courtrooms are removing the Bibles, so you're just like swearing on thin air or something. Just put up your hand and swear, but swearing to whom or to what and to who's the witness, uh, you know, that kind of... Uh, there's a, it becomes almost meaningless. Uh, the name of God only is that by which men ought to swear, and there it is to be used with all holy fear and reverence. So therefore, to swear falsely or rashly by that glorious and dreadful name, or to swear at all by anything, by any other thing, is sinful and to be abhorred. Yet, as in matters of weight and moment, an oath is warranted by the word of God under the New Testament as well as the Old. So a lawful oath being opposed by lawful authority in such matters ought to be taken. In other words, the Jehovah Witnesses are wrong. And the Anabaptists that the confession is addressing are wrong where they believed interpreting Jesus' words. So where are we? Question number 20, when may an oath be used? Uh, on weighty occasions, um, occasions of great moment. Not, not just flippantly and not rashly uh, and ordinarily we shouldn't need an oath which is the right way to understand what Jesus said <coughs> when he interprets um, this command you shall not swear falsely but shall perform to the Lord which you have sworn but I say to you do not take an oath at all either by heaven for it is the throne of God or by the earth for it is his footstool or by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king and do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Uh, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from, God, from evil. Uh, so what Jesus is saying is it's a bit of hyperbole. Uh, we know this because God puts himself under oath in the book of Hebrews. And the apostle Paul puts himself under oath in his epistles, where he says, with God as my witness. Come back Sunday night if you'd like to hear the details on, on, on that. And ordinarily, this is why it has to be a, a, mo a, a time of great uh, 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 importance and, and, and where there is, you know, like in a courtroom, an, a special need, a pressure being placed on witnesses to speak the truth. So ordinarily, though, you shouldn't need an oath. Ordinarily, uh, you know, when you see little kids saying, I swear, I swear. Uh, uh, you know, they, they have to do that because they already have a reputation for not telling the truth. So if you have a reputation for truth telling, you don't have to say, I, I swear, I promise, honest, really. You don't have to use all the extra verbiage. You just say what you're going to say and people know you're reliable. Your yes is yes and you know your is no. That's the kind of people we want to be. And that's, what, uh, that's the point that Jesus is making. He also, in Matthew 23, was criticizing evasions, evasive use of oaths, um, where you know, they, were, he were, they were saying, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing, but if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. I know it all sounds bizarre, but apparently that was being done. I swear by the temple, which is um, 
circumlocution, isn't that what it's called? For God. You swear by the temple, but what you really mean is by God, but you don't want to use the name of God. But then if you didn't swear by the gold in the temple, then you weren't bound by the oath. So these were evasive tactics that were used in order to get the weight implied by the use of an oath while still being to escape the obligation to tell the truth. And so Jesus denounces that in Matthew uh, 23. So when is an oath to be, to be used? Well, it's to be used only on, you know, on, on, on very, um, you know, on very uh, Im important uh, matters of uh, the language that's used, weight and moment. Um, for paragraph three, whoever taketh an oath ought to, uh, ought duly to consider the weightiness of so solemn an act, and there into avouch nothing but what he is fully persuaded is the truth. Neither may any man bind himself by oath to anything but what is good and just and what he believeth to be and what he is able and resolved to perform. Um, so um, why do we need oaths? Because people are dishonest. So we bind them by oaths. We put the, we, we, we make them take an oath and we, um, uh, we warn that we're going to punish you if you violate the oath. If you don't, if you if you if you if you lie, uh, there will be consequences. So that's why oaths are necessary. And I think that some of the reasons why the Anabaptists and Jehovah Witnesses are opposed to the youth of oaths is because they have a defective view of sin. They they have a defective view of human depravity. Yes, we will be dishonest if we can get away with it. And so when you know somebody's life is at stake or imprisonment is at risk, you need to be sure you're getting at the truth. So you put someone under an oath. So as to put the pressure on them uh, to tell the truth. I've noticed in Congress you get all kinds of you know, um, hearings and so forth. The ones that count are the ones where they put them under oath. Uh, when they're not under oath, a lot gets said. You put them under oath, it really limits uh, because there is the threat of legal action against you when you, when you, uh, when you lie under oath. Um, what is good and just, um, you know, you shouldn't be vowing uh, perpetual celibacy, in other words, not marrying, like the monastic vows, or vows of poverty, or obedience to another human authority, like the, the abbot at the monastery, uh, which are the, three, the three vows of the, of the monks was uh, obedience uh, to the superior, uh, you know, celibacy, uh, which was a vow not to marry or to sin sexually. Of course, you shouldn't sin sexually, but the vow not to marry, then you don't have the gift not to marry, that's what's being objected to by the confession. There are few, very few people who have the gift of celibacy apart and, and, and the gift of singleness. And those who don't, what should they do? They should get married. That's what 1 Corinthians 7 says. Um, an oath is to be taken in the plain and common sense of the words without equivocation or mental reservation. It cannot oblige the sin, but in anything not sinful, uh, being taken, it, it binds to performance, although to a man's own hurt, nor is it to be violated, although made to heretics or infidels. Again, it's, that's going after the Roman Catholics who, you know, they promise hus, uh, what a free, uh, free, free passage, uh, there's a technical term for it, um, where he, was, he would come to court and he was guaranteed he would be given a free uh, passage back uh, to, to uh, Prague and instead once they convicted him of heresy, they violated their oath. Because they don't, you don't have to keep a promise made to a heretic. And then he burned him at the stake. So they broke their promise. And then Rome justified that. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's casuistry that uh, you don't have to keep promises made to heretics. And so Jerome of Prague and, 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 uh, uh, um, and Huss were bur both burned at the stake. And this is why Luther, when he left Worms, <clears throat> was kidnapped by, was it Frederick? <laughs> Frederick kidnaps him and takes him to Wartburg and protects him in a, in castle, a castle there. Because the, the, the sense was, if they don't, the, the Catholic authorities are going to assassinate him or arrest him and haul him off to prison. Uh, five, a vow is like, of, of the like is of the like nature with a promissory oath and ought to be made with the like religious care and to be performed with like faithfulness. 
Uh, six, it is not to be made to any creature but to God alone, and that it may be accepted. It is to be made voluntarily out of faith and conscience of duty in a way of thankfulness for mercy received um, or for obtaining of what we want, whereby we more strictly bind ourselves to necessary duties or to other things so far as and so long as we may fitly conduce thereunto. All right, now here we go after Rome. Uh, no man may vow to do anything forbidden in the word of God or what would hinder any duty therein commanded or which is not in his own power and for the performance whereof he hath no promise of ability from God. In which respect, popish monastic vows of perpetual single life, professed poverty and regular obedience are so far from being degrees of higher perfection that they are superstitious and sinful snares in which no Christian may entangle himself. And when the reformers were writing the time of the Reformation, post-Reformation era, the corruption in the mon monasteries and the convents was outrageous. The numbers of children being born to nuns uh, and being fathered by monks was, was scandalous. All right. Uh, Okay, what sorts of oaths are lawful and forbidden? Lawful oaths are for things that are commanded and permitted. Forbidden, if you're not permitted to take an oath, um, uh, for things that one lacks the ability to do or that God forbids us to do. I promise that you know I'll jump off the building and fly to the, you know, flap my wings and fly to the ground. You don't have the ability to do that. You, can't, that. you cannot keep that promise. To cite a ridiculous example. Yes? Is there any meaningful distinction between vows and oaths? Or are they just used not as a... um, Section 5 discerns that. Uh, that's not a bad question. I, um, I, I think that they're essentially the same thing. Number, number it actually five. seems to distinguish that a vow would be a promissory oath made, yeah. made to God. Okay. Whereas a promissory oath could be, I, I swear to you by God but that I will do something. And a vow would be a promise to God. Okay. So does, that, does that seem, that seems consistent with what you had just read. Yeah. That makes sense. Vows are to God. Yeah, that, that, uh, that, I'll have to think about that. It's prob probably correct. Uh, it's a form of a promissory oath, uh, directly, um, uh, direct, directly being voiced to God. <coughs> All right, the next chapter on the civil magistrate. Uh, question number <coughs> 22, for what purpose did God ordain the civil magistrate? God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world, hath ordained civil magistrates to be under him over the people for his own glory and the public good, and to this end hath armed them with the power of the sword for the defense and encouragement of them that are good and for the punishment of evildoers. So two purposes, uh, defend the just, punish the evil. So for what purpose did God ordain the civil magistrate? That's, a, that's a, a, the essential two functions of civil government. That's a right out of Romans 13, and the language is right below the text there, as you can see, Romans 13, 1 through 4, called the minister of God twice, bearing the sword, an avenger who to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Uh, paragraph 2, it is lawful for Christians to accept and execute the office of a magistrate when called thereunto, and the managing whereof, as they might especially or ought especially <clears throat> to maintain piety, justice, and peace according to the wholesome laws of each commonwealth. So for that end, they may lawfully, now under the New Testament, wage war upon just and necessary occasions. So uh, there is an embracement there of just war theory. That's the language of, of uh, 
you know, going back to Augustine and the defense of just war. So may, may a Christian, um, what, what is our Christian duty uh, with regard to the office of a civil magistrate? Um, as, we, as we'll go on, I'm going to argue that Christians can serve as civil magistrates and execute justice and bear the sword, punishing evildoers, not as acts of personal vengeance, but as, um, uh, but as ministers of, of justice. All right, paragraph three. Civil magistrates may not assume to themselves the administration of the word and sacraments or the power of the keys of the kingdom of heaven or in the least interfere in matters of faith. Yet, it is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the church of our common Lord without giving the preference to any denomination of Christians above the rest in such a manner that all ecclesiastical persons, whatever, shall enjoy the full, free, and unquestioned liberty of discharging every part of their sacred functions without violence or danger. And as Jesus Christ hath appointed a regular government and discipline in his church, no law of any commonwealth should interfere with, let, or hinder the due exercise thereof among voluntary members of any denomination of Christians according to their own profession and belief. It is the duty of civil magistrates to protect the person and good name of all their people in such an effectual manner as that no person be suffered either upon pretense of religion or of infidelity to offer any indignity, violence, abuse, or injury to any other person whatsoever, or to take order that all religious ecclesiastical assemblies be held without, uh, and to take order that all religious and ecclesiastical assemblies be held without molestation or disturbance. All right. This is where it gets interesting. <coughs> the original wording of the confession says, after that introduction, yet he hath the civil magistrate authority, and it is his duty to take order that unity and peace be preserved in the church, that the truth of God be pure and entire, that all blasphemies and heresies be suppressed, all corruptions and abuses in worship and discipline prevented or reformed, and all the ordinances of God duly settled, administered, and observed, for the better effecting whereof he hath power to call synods, to be present at them, and to provide that whatsoever is transacted in them be according to the mind of God. You do see the difference. <laughs> Uh, okay, so there, there was a uh, you know, debate. Uh, the, the Westminster Divines are a synod called by Parliament. So they, Parliament has a vested interest in protecting the right of the civil government to control the church. Uh, and this is called Erastianism. And there are a lot of Erastians in the Parliament at the time who believe in a state church and who believe that the church has the right uh, to interfere in the internal affairs of the church. And so when the confession crosses the ocean and the constitution is ratified, the Presbyterians meet and they change the wording of this, of this section of the confession to what we just read. Uh, they are to protect the church but they are not to give preference and they're not to interfere with the internal functions of the church. So it, uh, it gets altered quite a bit in the American situation. Um, I have cited the Latin principle that dominated uh, the uh, the um, you know the European view for a very long time. Custos utrius table. Anybody want to translate that? The keeper of 
keeper of both the tables, isn't that what it was? Mm -hmm. The keeper of both tables? Um, or the two tables. That's what it said in the notes. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's in there somewhere, but I, I can't remember what's in the notes. Yeah. The keeper of both tables. Yeah. yeah, the dominant view in the 17th century was that the, you know, the civil government has the responsibility to, to punish heresies and ensure that orthodoxy is maintained in the church. So you, you, know, you don't have that separation principle in Europe. That's why you still have state churches. That's why in New England, the congregationalism was the state church. In Virginia, Anglicanism was the state church. Uh, I think 11 out of 13 colonies had state churches, not national churches, but state churches at the time of the ratification of the Constitution. So that's, that's, uh, that's the Constantinian view. That goes all the way back to, you know, <coughs> that goes back to the act of the, um, uh, the Edict of Milan, uh, the Edict of Toleration, and then following that when Christianity becomes the only religion allowed in the Roman Empire, that it becomes the role of the civil government to punish heretics and blasphemers. So the keeper of both tables, huh? Yeah, that uh, that sounds like it's uh, that's uh, that's right. Um, uh, so there's there was a battle um, in in um, you know there was a battle in in in, in, in the assembly over this, and uh, at one point this uh, this George Selden gets up and defends the Erastian view. Um, uh, the, the, there. So this this section this section here was unapproved was not approved by Parliament. Selden defends the Parliament's view, which is Parliament has final say. Um, what the divines wanted was the Lord Jesus as King and Head of the Church hath here and appointed a government in the hand of church officers distinct from the civil magistrate. They didn't want that. They didn't want that to separation between the administration of the church and the administration of the civil government. So George Gillespie, the Scot. John Selden, not George Selden, rises up um, to answer Sel uh, Selden and defend the divine rights, the jus divinum of the church to govern its own affairs. <clears throat> and he says, according to Rutherford, uh, Rutherford says to him, rise, George, rise up, man, and defend the right of the Lord Jesus Christ to govern by his own laws the church which he hath purchased with his own blood. So this church state, uh, this uh, debate was a hotly deb de debated thing at the time of the uh, writing of the confession. Um, and in the end, parliament prevails. But when it crosses the ocean, then it gets revised. And uh, the civil government is, is um, just the, the, the authority of the civil government is distinct, is held distinct from the authority of church government and that they are uh, separated. Our duty toward the civil magistrates, it is the duty of the people to pray for magistrates, to honor their persons, to pay them tribute or other dues, um, to obey their lawful commands and to be subject to their authority for conscience sake. Infidelity or uh, difference in religion doth not make void the magistrates just and legal authority nor free people from their due obedience to them from which ecclesiastical persons are not exempted. So, you know, because God told you to do something that the civil magistrates uh, uh, are not permitting, is, uh, that's being denied. Um, nor free the people from their due obedience to them from which ecclesiastical persons are not exempted, much less have to poke any power or jurisdiction over them in their dominions or over any of, the, of their people, and least of all to deprive them of their dominions or lives if he shall judge them to be heretics or upon any other pretense whatsoever. <clears throat> So what, what is our duty with regard to the office of the civil magistrate? Honor them, uh, pray for them. Um, uh, and what is the job of the civil magistrate with regard to the church? You know, I, it does have a responsibility to protect it, but it is not to interfere with the internal affairs of the church. It is no business administering 
on the internal affairs of the church. So, so as an example, when Christ's church went to court over who was going to have control of the property and the, the title deed was in the hand of the, um, they don't call it, a, they call it the consistory? What did the Anglicans call their um, governing board? Uh, the vestry. The vestry. The vestry. Right, they had the title deeds mm -hmm. in their hands. And um, so that there was a question of who represents Christ's church. And the, the state government presumed to know how to answer that question. It should have been, to me, it should have been argued strictly on property law, on the basis of property law. Instead, they rendered a theological judgment as to who represented Christ's church uh, ecclesiastically. And so they lost the case because they presumed to know how to make that judgment about which is the Christ, the true Christ church, the, the, the vast minority who, who claimed the right to the building versus the majority and the vestry who held the property deed and were moving uh, the church into the Anglican, out of the Episcopal and into the Anglican communion. Have I got that right, Tom? Yes, yes, yes sir. Yeah, so I, have, I, thought, I thought that that should have been challenged and taken to the Supreme Court because the civil courts don't have any business deciding who, who are the rightful, um, who, who rightfully can claim to be Christ's church? And what, by what criteria? Is it going to be doctrine? Are, you, are they competent to decide doctrine? If it's a property issue, then it's a matter of who holds the title deeds. Mm -hmm. Yes? Was there a good bit of tension over the trying to keep churches from meeting, you know, the state trying to, or even the city trying to dictate that versus our own wishes? Were they kind of intruding there on what the church should be able to do and not do? Or did just COVID overlap that? Um, you're talking about what we decided to do during COVID? Right. But I mean, you know, the state here is trying to dictate what, or the city in this case is trying to dictate what we can do during the meeting versus yeah. what we can't do. That's almost an infringement upon what we're able to do. Or did we just come to a really good agreement at the time? Um, no, we pushed back. From the very beginning, we pushed back because because it was um, our conviction that the church to be the church must assemble. Yeah, we are not the church good. if we don't assemble. We must assemble. Um, so we were willing to, on a temporary basis, limit what we did, understanding that it was only going to be temporary, and we were going to evaluate as we went. So we never stopped having services, right. um, which. Uh, and in order to try to comply with the, you know, the confession and scripture, so I contacted the mayor's office and I contacted the governor's office. And I didn't ask for permission, but I said, we are going to continue to meet. We have a large space. We're going to socially distance. We're going to have 50 people in a very large space. Um, I'm just letting you know. And the mayor's office was particularly funny. Uh, they they uh, called back and said, we don't, that's fine. We don't mess with the churches. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Well, and you know, there was a lot of churches that you heard about that were actually told they couldn't meet. You know, they, they were under the impression that the city that the city told them they can't meet. Yeah, California was draconian in their enforcement. And so John MacArthur, you know, pushed back and it ended up that goes high to the Supreme Court. I forget how high it went, but it you know, they challenged it and they won. And so we were willing to go along for six weeks. And then we said, No, no we're gonna we're going to now we can still socially distance, we've got a large space, so then we went to 150, then we went to 250. So by week eight, we were back to our entire church could gather on Sunday in two services and be distanced in the, in the, uh, in the You in do the, have the state, in, or the city, or the state intruding upon the do. decisions that should be should You do, be made. so I think that's why we push back. Right. You know, I thought that, okay, you don't, you don't, re you really cannot tell us not to do this. I mean. I'm, if they're, you know, we didn't know what was going on with COVID at the time. We didn't know if, you know, it was the plague and we're, you know, just millions of people going to die. So it made sense to comply with the directions, and we did. We were socially distanced. Um, but as time began to pass, um, we we felt that we could we could continue to meet and still be reasonably in compliance with what was required. Whereas there were some Christian churches, I think, that have destroyed themselves. My sister's church in Pleasanton, California, no longer exists. It blew up over this. Why? They just closed their doors. Um, 
they didn't meet for two years, and by then, I mean, the, ch the church had dispersed and it was gone. It was completely destroyed. Yes? Um, so if the civil government no longer um, <coughs> encourages the just and defends the just from punishing evil, what do you then do as a Christian? Are you allowed to almost rebel or revolt? Or do you need to try and internally reform? Like, what course of action can a Christian take? So the reformed view, the reformed faith has been a revolutionary faith. And the reason is, in the last edition of the Institutes, Calvin inserted an exception for, for resistance to tyranny, in which he said that Christians may resist not by you know, storming the barricades in the streets, but through lesser magistrates, so that the Prince of Navarre could lead the people of his region in resistance to the tyranny of the French king, that sort of thing. And so that, that, that had meant that William of Orange would lead the Dutch against the Spanish monarchy, okay, the Dutch reform. That meant that um, the, um, you know, the, Ameri the, the English um, Puritans through parliament, again, not storming the streets, not anarchy, but through the legal uh, authority of parliament resisted uh, the, the, the British monarchy, as did the Scottish Covenanters. That means the American, uh, likewise, the war for independence, that was all on the basis of state legislatures. And then meeting in Congress with representatives dis determining to resist what they saw as the tyranny. Now whether or not there was real tyranny, that's another issue. But do Christians have the right to resist tyranny uh, through lesser magistrates' lawful authorities? Uh, and likewise, you won't like this one probably, or some of you won't, the Confederate states also. Those were votes by state legislatures. So it wasn't you know, a bunch of rednecks grabbing their muskets and you know, firing on Union troops. It was an orderly process of secession that claimed constitutional right to do it uh, based on the votes of state legislatures. Uh, uh, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That word indivisible was, was, uh, was never um, agreed upon during the pre-Civil War era. So the, the northern maritime states threatened to secede in the 1830s. So there's real debate over whether or not you have the right to secession. But it's not revolution, it's, it's, it's lawful separation. Okay, we gotta go. Sorry, we're over time.